Hello everyone from Tony the Scar Ghost. I'm super happy to be here today with you with Jake Z, Senior Vice President of Virtual Reality at Sony Picture Entertainment. Uh, Jake, thanks for being here with me. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Tony. So, Jake, can you please introduce yourself to my readers? Uh, you can do that better than me for sure. Okay, I'll give it a shot. You did a pretty good job. Um, I'm Jake Zim. I am the SVP of virtual reality at Sony Pictures Entertainment. Basically, I oversee all of our immersive entertainment uh, businesses uh, with a focus on virtual reality. We publish VR games and experiences across platforms. We're platform agnostic. We work very closely with our PlayStation partners, um, but we also have games on the Oculus and PC platforms. And we always try to focus on using our intellectual property brands like Jumanji and Ghostbusters and Men in Black to broaden out the, uh, the VR world, to bring new IP and experiences to the community in ways that will feel familiar to them uh, and also excite them and move the business forward. That's amazing. I invite your job. But just to clarify one thing, because, you know, corporates are very division. Uh, they are the part of Sony that is working on the PSVR, the, on the PS5, the others working on software. So exactly what does your division do? And what is the difference with, with the other ones? Yeah, it's a great question. So I work for the movie studio, for Sony Pictures Entertainment. So it's movies and TV. Um, and as, as part of the overall Sony group, PlayStation, Sony Interactive Entertainment, is another division. Uh, and we're all part of the same group. We work very, very closely together. But really, I live within the movie and TV world. And the theory was that when virtual reality started to become a commercial product, when PSVR was first launched, when the first Rift product was going out, when... Uh, when vibes were being um, sold. The idea was is that we could take our worlds from our movies and TV and recreate those narratives, open up that immersive experience for the audiences. And so because as uh, storytellers, which is what we do at the movie studio, we tell stories, right, in linear forms. Uh, as storytellers, we saw this as a new platform. And, and the thesis was, if there was a new platform that had this concept of agency and immersiveness, then we should be telling stories based on the worlds that we know audiences love on this new platform. So, and among one of these amazing movies that you're trying to port to VR, I can, I can talk about Zombieland that you have launched uh, some weeks ago. So let's talk about it. So can you describe uh, Zombieland in some words to people who are watching this video? Uh, how have you decided to port it to VR? Right, so, so Zombieland is a great uh, example of where we've leaned into one of our uh, most beloved IPs, the world of Zombieland. We have two great Zombieland movies that are out in the world. And we said, is there, is there a fantasy? Is there a, um, a wish fulfillment that can be delivered only on VR? Well, of course, fans of Zombieland know that in this crazy world where you're surviving from hordes of zombies with these crazy characters um, from the movie, the idea would be to blast zombies, to survive these waves who come in and, uh, and attack you. And so the idea was, can we fulfill that fantasy of being in the world of Zombieland in VR. So we worked with a very talented group of developers, um, a company called XR Games, based in the UK. And um, we, we developed a game that essentially is a, it's sort of like a time crisis game. Uh, it's a light gun arcade style game. Uh, it's on rails, it's a shooter, and it's a speed run game. You wanna kill as many zombies as you can in as short amount of time as possible. We launched the game on, on Quest a few weeks ago, end of March, uh, and it's been doing fantastically well. The user reviews are great. We love seeing how people love being in the world of Zombieland. They want more content, um, and they love the sort of replayability factor of the game. So we're really excited about the way that's going. Wow, well, compliments for, for the successful launch. I've also seen it in all the major VR magazines, like Upload and this kind of stuff. 
also with very positive reviews. Um, about this positive reviews, this opinion, in your opinion, in Jake's opinion, what are the, the best features, the best selling points of this game? So I think it's a really easy to pick up and play game. That's number one. For us, there's, um, there's, a, there's a use case for VR that is very deep and, um, and takes us really high skill mastery to play VR games. And there's some wonderful games that are, that are very robust and built for, for a very in-depth user. But we believe that because the IPs that we bring are meant to be accessible to people, they're meant to be familiar, they're meant to say, hey, I want to live in that world. We want to make games that are, that are easy to play, uh, relatively straightforward. And we made Zombieland with XR Studios with the mandate of make this a easy to pick up and play game um, so there wasn't a huge barrier to entry. And I think that's one of the, the key selling points to the game. Uh, it's frenetic, it's fun, it's crazy. Um, it is a pure shooter and it has an adrenaline system where if you get two headshots in a row, the whole game slows down. So it's really skill-based. If you can nail those headshots and have great accuracy, uh, you can slow the game down and achieve a better score. And then so you have this competitive component with leaderboards where we see people all around the world who are you know, battling to get, to, their to get their names on the top of the leaderboard. So it's really, really fun. It's accessible, it's got really cool mechanics, and there's a competitive nature to it, which we love. That's cool. So let's talk instead about the critics. So the community sometimes can be pretty harsh, and the main critic that I've read is that another VR zombie game. So because there have been a lot of zombie games until now. So what do you answer to this critic? Do you think there is something that makes it special if compared with the other ones? Yeah, well, that's why we think the brand is so important in cutting through the clutter. Look, there's a lot of VR games that are zombie related and some fantastic ones out there. Um, and we don't want to compete head to head with some of those games, but they're different. Uh, our game is not a crafting game. It's not a pure survival game. It's a speed run shooter, but I think most importantly for us, we lean into the, the IP, the fact that this is Zombieland. So we went to great lengths to make sure that the movie brand really felt, um, was, was, was felt in this game. So to do that, we, we worked with writers who had worked on the movie campaign to make sure that the dialogue in the game felt like it was in sync with the Zombieland brand. All the voiceover work was done um, really hand in hand with the talent themselves or with uh, sound alikes that, um, that they had approved. The likeness of the actors was really important for us to have. The sardonic humor, the sort of dark humor of Zombieland, the in game graphics, the rules that people love from the Zombieland movies. So for us, what, what makes it different is by definition, it is Zombieland, it is the brand itself. Um, and that was really important because there's a lot of great zombie, ga zombie games out there. Uh, and we knew that we wanted to stand out by being authentic to the brand itself. Okay, that's perfectly clear. So in the end, what, who do you think is the, the typical player of this game? Uh, what kind of VR player do you identify as the perfect one for this game? Well, the, the, the primary target audience is the VR enthusiast. So. It's players who love picking up fun, repeatable games. Um, it's a shooter game, so obviously we want people who are interested in you know, frenetic, fast-paced FPS type action. Um, uh, it's, not a, it's not a strategy game necessarily, unless you consider sort of your accuracy shooting uh, as strategy. Um, so it's a, it's a hardcore VR fan game first. Secondly, it's fans of the brand. You know, we believe that uh, part of our job is to grow the, the user base of VR by making these brands great games in VR. So it's really one of my favorite things to read the user reviews on the Quest Store and see people say, hey, I'm a fan of Zombieland. I love those movies. I'm gonna try this game out. I tried it and it was better than I expected. So our really, our secondary target was fans of the brand. And then our third target is competitive gamers, people who like to compete with each other for their own reputation, because this game does have that uh, competitive nature, that leaderboard component to it. Uh, so we really looked at it from those three key targets. 
Okay, so you, you you mentioned a lot the, the importance of the brand. Personally, I watched the, the Zombieland movie. I loved it. It was amazing. And I was wondering, how is it difficult about a, a movie to VR? I think it's your job in many of the games you have contributed to release, like uh, the one of the Groundhog Day, et cetera, et cetera. So how is it difficult to do that? And how do you perform that? It's really the secret sauce for us that we have to we have to get right. It it is ultimately the core question that we have to answer. And when we think about a translation from a movie or TV IP, which is created for a linear format, and we look at translating that into a VR game, which is fully immersive, gives agency to the user, has all kinds of interactivity, um, we have a process. And the process, which we've developed over time, really breaks down to one core thing. Is there a core fantasy that we can deliver to the audience, to the user, that, um, that will be compelling and appeal to them? Uh, so when you think about something like Ghostbusters, right, which we've done in VR, um, and we will continue to, great, to, to produce more VR content for Ghostbusters, is there a core fantasy of being a ghostbuster and busting ghosts? Yeah. Is that fun in VR, right? And doing it with your friends and having fun doing it and a little bit of scary in there. We think there is. So we go through 20 questions that we have and we basically get to the point where we sort of define, does this core fantasy feel like we can manifest it in VR? If so, let's explore this project. If not, let's look at a different IP. And so we did that with Zombieland. And we came to a clear and def definitive, yes, there is a core fantasy of being in this world, surviving, killing zombies <laughs> right? with, uh, with all the great characters from the movie. Pardon, pardon, I got my uh, dog barking at a delivery here. But, um, uh, and so we came to a, you know, a very clear yes on that. Um, yeah. So, okay, that's, that's uh, absolutely very interesting. So I haven't, I didn't thought about the, this process, how, well. So this is very interesting. This process is, is amazing. And I want also to understand, so you, you say that you, you think about the fantasy. Uh, so what do you like to do in the movie? But how to keep the the right atmosphere of the movie so for instance zombieland was a, a movie about zombies but it was also funny it was sarcastic so uh, have you managed to keep this atmosphere in this game and again what is the process for that right so once we decide if there's a core fantasy that we can deliver then we think about immersion so if the expectation from the user, from the gamer, from the player, is to your point that the brand has inherent pillars of comedy uh, or horror um, or uh, sort of stylized violence, if you will, like Z Zombieland, we need to replicate those in the game because we want to keep the idea of immersion. And the idea of immersion for VR really goes beyond feeling like you're inside of a world it has the additional layer of feeling like you're inside the world of Zombieland. So specifically what we do, and I think this is one of the benefits and the uniquenesses of being at Sony and Sony Pictures, is we work very closely with the team that made the movie. So, you know, very early on in the process, I reached out to Ruben Fleischer, the directors of the movie, director of the movies, uh, to the producers, and we said, hey, we're looking to develop this game. Um, you know, what is the core DNA of this movie? And we talked to writers, we talked to the artists, we talked to the visual effects group, uh, and we try to get as much from what we would consider sort of the brand essence uh, from the movie. And then from there, in our development process, uh, even in the scripting of dialogue, for example, we work with writers who worked on the movie. Uh, in one way or another, maybe in the marketing campaign, for example. In the case of Zombieland, we worked with um, with writers who had worked on the marketing campaign so that we feel very uh, connected to what the campaign and the brand itself was. Uh, so really, it's it's part of being at the movie studios, the benefit of being at Sony, where we can sit within the nexus of the entire brand 
look at where the brand has been, look at where the, where the creative and the talent that 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 made this successful movie brand uh, uh, came from, and we under, we try to understand how we can apply that into VR, with the adjustment of making it not just interactive, right? It's not a flatty game, it's an immersive game. So what does that mean in terms of the art style? What does that mean in terms of the types of interactions you would have with characters? What does that mean in terms of marketing materials? Uh, and all of those things have to go into the discussion of developing the game. And as you know, they have to go into the production schedule and into a, a risk assessment. You know, what happens if we can't nail this? What happens if it adjusts our, uh, our production schedule? Uh, well, that's all part of the fun of the process. And hopefully we deliver something that people love. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, this has happened with Zombieland. And yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, it's a fun process. I think it's uh, you, you also got some headaches probably in these years. <laughs> but in the end, uh, since you are producing lots of content, it seems that you're doing a great job in it. So how people can buy Zombieland if they want to to buy and play it? Is it only for the Quest or also for other platforms? All right, so so you can go right now and buy it on the Quest. It's available right now. It's uh, it's it should be easy to find, and and the ratings are great, and it's doing doing really well. Uh, we will be shipping it on PSVR uh, and PC later on. Uh, some announcements on the timing on that coming soon. Um, but if you have a Quest, I highly recommend getting it and playing it on the Quest and seeing if you can get your uh, your name on the leaderboard. There's additional content coming. There'll be much, uh, some really exciting campaign, competitive campaign elements coming. Um, some announcements on that stuff will be coming soon. But for the moment, uh, go out and get it on the Quest Store. Okay, that's, that's a nice advice. And now I would like to talk with you about a more general picture about uh, your, your work and game development, especially related to IPs, that is your main expertise. So you work with many titles, like uh, title this is Zombieland, but you work with Count of Day, you work with Ghostbusters, with Spider-Man, and many others. So what is, I know it's it's complicated questions, like asking a father what's a favorite child, but what is your favorite one and why? Wow, well, we do have, you know, the sort of general saying, we love all our children equally, right? Yeah. That, you know, in, in, in the movie business and the games business, it's hard to pick a favorite. But but look, I've got a variety of different favorites for different reasons. And and part of it is because, as you know, anybody in this space knows, this is this VR ecosystem is has been a journey. It's an it's a roller coaster. Yeah. There have been ups and downs along the way. And I think we all who have been in this community for a while recognize that this is a long journey. Um and there's something exciting about every turn that we make, every game that gets shipped, whether it's my game or your game or anybody's game, every new platform announcement, the community is excited about it. Um, so for me, the answer is I can tell you every single game that we've shipped. We've shipped over 17 games in wow. locations and in home, Void projects, you know, Dave and Buster's projects. Uh, we've got a Dreamscape project that's going to be coming back um, and then in-home games every single one of them has a story behind it spider-man is a lot of fun to talk about because the two spider-man games that we've shipped have done amazingly well in terms of the penetration the installs um, and the community response to being able to swing through manhattan as spider-man which was something that originally we were very nervous about you know, when we first shipped our Spider-Man Homecoming game in 2015 or so, what was it, 2017, sorry, 2017, that game was a, was a short little game that introduced the web shooters for Spidey. Yeah. Um, and it was meant to promote our movie. And at the very end of that game, you get a little tease of swinging on a web swing. Uh, and what we saw from the community was they wanted more web swinging. They wanted to be able to swing. And, and, and so we said, okay, they want it. Let's give it to them. And we went and made the Far From Home game, uh, which was a little longer, about 30 minutes with a sort of mini boss in it. But it was all about web swinging. And that moment um, when we saw the response from the community, uh, 
that we had done something that they had asked for and it, and it seemed to work and people really loved it. That was a huge moment for us. It was a great moment for me. It was a great moment for my team, great moment for our developers, Create VR, who, who made that game. And it really signaled that this journey that we are all on together is going to have ups and downs, but ultimately there's a growing community. There's an appetite for risk. People want to try new things. And if we work with great developers, we can deliver great immersive experiences that are only going to get better over time as technology gets better, as pipelines get faster and smarter, and as the community grows. So every game I've launched, I could tell you a story about. We could, we could, we could spend a lot of time you know, talking about it. Um, but it's all about the learnings and the growth. And, and now we're at a point where this is a business. That's what's most exciting to me. Now we're at a point where this community is seeing real returns and developers who've taken risk to make games are getting their money, <laughs> which is key to, to create yeah. an ecosystem that, that keeps going. So um, that's extremely exciting to me. And, it, and it, it's great to, to feel like we've been a part of that in some, in some small way or another. Well, we are both in the, in the VR ecosystem since many years. And we are both in growing and all this time. Of course, we operate at a very different level. So from you that work in a, in a big company making big games, how have you seen the change of in the, how people develop VR games? So how is different? What was different for you developing a game in 2017? Or how is it different now? So what is changing in these years? Well, you know, there's, a, there's some really tough things about developing games in general um, that are exacerbated when the hardware specs change as frequently as they do in VR. So when you've got new headsets, new controllers, different standards, and developers kind of have to pick and choose what their bet is going to be, mm. uh, that can be really tough. It can be really tough for, for planning a project. Um, and we've had that experience with some of our early projects, not really knowing where the market was going, um, uh, but building something that we thought was great and the community perhaps just not being there at the time. Um, but I think what we're getting now is, uh, uh, I don't want to call it a maturing phase, but a phase where certain standards, um, hardware standards, specs, production pipelines that are building on tech stacks that have been developed already, mechanics that essentially have been proven out, like swinging, for example, movement mechanics, comfort standards. We're starting to get a base layer where the developer community has essentially established some, 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 some basics. And a lot of this is, is you know, thanks to, to what Oculus has done with their developer ecosystem, what PlayStation has done. Um, and so you're getting developers who have, have a little experience now. You know, they're, they're building on a tech stack that they've already developed that's got some proven mechanics. The hardware targets are solidifying. Um, the game engines are supporting VR in a much more robust way. So you're getting bigger and better games, multiplayer, multiplayer protocols, cross-platform, um, all the key components that I think feed the developer ecosystem as well as the consumer uh, experience are starting to, I don't want to use the word mainstream, but are, are starting to standardize, mm. which just, just creates more certainty in the whole process and allows us ultimately to say, hey, let's keep building bigger and better games um, that highlight more and more of these features that people are familiar with. And that's really important for the growth of the industry overall. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that as well, especially I remember the first time I used Unity with VR in 2014 was like crashing every time. I have terrible memories of lots of hours of work lost because of continuously crashing. Instead, now it is super stable. It works with the headset. So I, I completely agree with what you say. It's a, it's a great moment now. But how is it going to become? So how do you envision your games in five, ten years? So I know it's, it, every one of us like to talk about five to ten years. So let's keep this trend and your games, IP inspired games that will launch in the future. How do you think that will be compared to what is now in the market? 
Well, I, I think that the trend, whether it's, I mean, t 10 years from now is really hard to prognosticate where things are going to be in the gaming industry in general, let alone VR. But I think in the, in the future, in the near-term future, multiplayer at scale, which we're starting to already see the power of with games, I mean, with the Rec Room community and, and Pop One and Onward and, you know, any kind of multiplayer game, uh, even games that started off as single player but now have multiplayer um, components to them. Beat Saber is a good example. I think multiplayer is, is, is gaming. Uh, there will always be campaign modes and solar player modes, um, but I think the idea of multiplayer, especially while we are all so con so disconnected, you know, this pandemic has, oh. has disconnected a lot of people who have then reached out for connection through gaming. Um, I think virtual reality offers something unique in connection, in virtual connection, that gaming can really touch on. So. I'm a big believer in anything multiplayer, anything social in VR, because I think ultimately it can differentiate itself from the other ways that we are forced to connect through digital devices on screens, uh, on phones, in games. VR can do something different. It can actually bring you somewhere and, and you can have a chance to, to be in a virtual environment with other people. Uh, and then you add a gaming element to that inside of a, a brand like Ghostbusters or Jumanji, that just is exciting. And, and it's a wish fulfillment offer that, that we're really excited about. Yeah. Um, you talk about uh, the, the business journey of the, VR, of the VR ecosystem, like the, now the ecosystem is more mature, is more profitable. So uh, how do you think it is healthy now? How is it difficult to sell VR games? So we are at the stage that triple A studios can jump in, or do you think that we still need a bit of time to for that? Well, it's it's still a nascent business. I mean, you know, in the in the short term trajectory of the recent VR ecosystem, call it you know since 2015, let's say, since, since consumer products really started yeah. coming out in 2016, last five years, there's been huge leaps forward, really in the last couple of years, I would say, with, with what, what the Quest product has done for the market in a positive way. But we're still at a very early stage, I think, in the long play. And people have to remember that. You know, we have to be patient here. These are new platforms. Uh, they're going to take a long time to get to the point where we should even consider calling them, you know, mature. So we're not there yet. Um, but I think, you know, the, the direction that it's going is in the world of gaming, I think the question is, does VR fit as a niche or is it its own standalone type of product and experience? And I think for, for a while, VR was really just a niche um, early on. You know, it was a subset of gaming mm. for a specific type of gamer. However, now I think what we're starting to see and what we're going to start seeing more and more is virtual reality becoming its own entertainment platform. And whereas you may want to play on a PC console in a traditional game environment and also have a VR experience, I think more and more we're going to find a community of users that are really moving into VR for gaming, for social interaction, for productivity, for communication, put aside healthcare and entertainment and other industries that are now moving more and more into VR as well. But I think that what that means is that you're going to have a distinct category of interaction and entertainment that is VR uh, as opposed to just being a subset of gaming. And I think that's really exciting because it allows VR to become independent, to become more mainstream, if you will, uh, and, and, and develop in ways that it, it couldn't if it was just a subset of gaming. There will always be a strong gaming component to the VR experience. That's really where we've seen it start because that's where the commercialization has been. That's where the money is, right? Yeah. That's sort of first phase. But I think what we're going to start seeing is a bifurcation of the VR ecosystem into a, a more independent space that incorporates things like virtual desktop. I mean, look, look at, look at, 
look at where the virtual desktop application is on the Oculus store. It's right up there with Beat Saber. So people yeah. are finding ways to be productive in VR. Um, and a lot of that is accelerated by the pandemic. You know, people are forced to, 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 to put on uh, headsets and interact through computers and screens in ways that they didn't have to before in order to get things done and engage with other human beings. Yeah. Um, you mentioned also about uh, the location-based VR sector because VR is at home entertainment, but there was a time that people were talking that the future was location-based VR before the pandemic, of course. Now it seems that uh, the uh, location-based VR market could come back. We are seeing that Sandbox uh, has reborn from the ashes. We are seeing the Hologate as many customers as well. And it is a sector you have worked in because you uh, collaborated with The Boy and with Dreamscape. So um, I want to ask you, um, how is it difficult to make and sell a location-based VR game? With, with what are the differences of doing it with an, in a tone game like Zombieland? Well, let me start by saying I'm a huge fan of location-based VR for, for a couple reasons. You know, VR um, can be very hard to introduce to people for the first time. There's a saying, you know, your, your, your first bad VR experience is your last VR experience. Yes. So people who have a bad experience in VR for the first time are more difficult to get back into a headset. Uh, and what's wonderful about really good location-based VR, like The Void was, like Sandbox, like Dreamscape, some of these other great um, experiences, Hologate is another one, is that they're highly curated, the content is well-designed, and generally speaking, there are there are people there to help you get in and out of the headset. And so the positive consumer feedback on great location-based VR is good for the industry because it introduces VR oftentimes to consumers who may not have had, you know, a chance to put on a Quest or, or play a great PlayStation VR game. So as a, as a means to grow the overall in-home business or the overall VR ecosystem, location-based VR certainly as a category is an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, that being said, you know, look, the pandemic shut down location-based uh, entertainment, uh, not just VR, but, but, but lots and lots of different industries, commercial yeah. industries. And that is an unfortunate um, event. However, uh, I think that location-based VR um, in the right business model can and will come back and we're seeing that, um, like you mentioned, Sandbox is opening up more locations. Uh, Hologate just recently re released a report that shows that its weekly user numbers are back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and there are other location-based VR businesses that are, I think, going to come back reimagined in a new way. So I think location-based VR has a, has, a, has a place in the overall ecosystem. And frankly, when we started the Sony Pictures VR business, in 2016, we didn't realize how important it was going to be early on, um, but we did do some, I think, very important projects in the space. We did two projects with The Void, Ghostbusters and Jumanji, both of which were were great, great experiences, and and hopefully they will they will be available again at some point. Um, and we have a couple others in the location-based space that we are, you know, still excited about re-rolling out. Um, but location-based VR can be a very difficult business. It's not the business that I'm in personally in terms of SPVR. We're not in that business directly, although we, we, we produce content for LBVR. Um, but it, it's a different kind of experience and an important one in the overall growth of the, uh, of the whole industry. And what are, well, is there a different process importing, you know, uh, an IP that you have to end an at home game from the one that you use for an NLBVR game. So is it more or less the same process or are there some key differences in how to design the game? There are some very important differences, mainly based on some objectives of things like throughput, business objectives. Um, we always start with the story though. 
we always start with the, with the narrative and the core fantasy. So for Jumanji, which was a, uh, a multiplayer VR experience that we did with The Void, the idea was, you know, the, obviously the movie is about going into a video game. So it was a perfect fit for, for VR and for The Void. But the, but the core fantasy was, what would, you, what would you want to be like if you were dropped into a video game? You'd have strengths and weaknesses, just like in the movie. You'd be one of the iconic characters you know, played by our, our our amazing actors, you know, Dwayne Johnson, Kevin Hart, Jack Black, Karen Gillum. You'd be one of those iconic characters. You'd have peril. You'd lose lives. Um, you'd have uh, all kinds of tactical components uh, like they do in the movies. We needed to import all of that wish fulfillment opportunity into the game and then design the game and write the game. So again, it felt like it was on brand. But then you have to think about it from the point of view of how do you get four people through a thousand square foot space uh, in 15 minutes? What are the key threshold game design elements that are going to move people along? How do you write dialogue so that if they're, you know, if they're uh, sticking around in the wrong place for too long, you move them forward with some AI components? Yeah. Uh, so it's a much different creative process and technical process. Very fun, very exciting, and and the the team at the Void who worked on that was was amazing. They just they know their stuff better than anybody else, um, and uh, and so that was a that was a great experience. That again, I hope I hope we can relaunch that at, at some point. I wish I wish that to you. Uh, will Zombieland ever have a multiplayer version? Say it again, Tony. I missed that. Can Will Zombieland ever have a location-based VR version? Maybe, maybe um, that would be really exciting and fun. And you know, now that we've produced uh, a game that 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 the audiences really love, um, and we're getting great reviews and and doing really well uh, in home, uh, it's certainly a brand that I think has that kind of flexibility that can be location-based. So yeah. Okay, fingers crossed for that. And so, without making you lose your job, so can you give us some hints about what you, will you work on in the future? <laughs> uh, let me see. What can I say? Um, well, we have a lot of stuff going on. Let me put it this way. I can't give you anything specific right now. We do have some announcements that we'll be making soon, so we can we can we can uh, we can we can think about how to how to make that. Um, possible together in the future. But I, I think the core areas for us are really the depth of our catalog. So we have a catalog of over 4,000 IPs, and those are movies, TV, game shows, uh, all kinds of really exciting IPs. So we're working on uh, both location-based and in-home projects that go really deep into our catalog, as well as some of the big theatrical blockbuster movies that, that you know and love some of the ones we've talked about. Um, and, you know, we, we are really excited about the um, commitment that PlayStation has made to the next generation VR. That's great for the ecosystem. Yeah. And you can bet we'll be working very closely with, with our PlayStation partners on projects for the future. And we love working with Oculus. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, and the PC market is, is great too. So, all I can really tell you right now is that we've got a lot of projects from our catalog. We're going to keep focusing on our IP, which we believe we can really continue to introduce to audiences in new ways. And we'll always be working across all the platforms uh, in both in-home and location-based. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Keep us posted about what, uh, what we will do in the future. So um, about, you know, there are probably many people like me that, uh, developers or that have the dream to make a game and since you in your in your career you've launched many games you work in this industry in vr since many years so you have a lot of experience and if you had to share with the community one big lesson that you've learned all these years that you can share with everyone to make them improve so what would it be Wow, that's a big question. Well, you know, I, I this is I went to OC two, Oculus Connect two, um, at 
think it was OT2. I think it was. And Michael A. Brash spoke and he said some, you know, head of research for, for Oculus at the time, still is, uh, and, and sort of one of the, you know, real blue flame thinkers in this space, really, really smart, amazing guy. Um, and he's always my favorite speaker to listen to at, at any of the Oculus Connect events because he talks about the future and the research that's being done to, to take what is extremely difficult. Anyone who's working in this space knows how difficult VR is. It's hard work. It's hard work from a hardware standpoint, from a software standpoint. It's hard to get people to understand what VR is unless they put a headset on. And Michael Abrash said something that really resonated with me. He said he had that he's going to dedicate the next 10 years of his life to working on this. And what that said to me was, this is a long game. This is a, this is a long journey. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but this is, this is not going to be easy. But if it was easy, everyone could do it. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest piece of advice that I give to anybody who's in this space is be in it for the long game. Recognize that this is a growth business. Okay, it's not going away. It's just going to grow. Um, it's an extremely exciting and difficult business, but stick with it. Keep building mechanics. Keep building um, tools. Keep building. Keep solving problems. I'm going to be in this for the next ten years of my life, if not more. Hopefully, uh, you should be in it for the next ten years of your life. We should all be in it for the next ten years of our life. And I think that's the key piece of advice, if I could even offer any advice, is this is a this is a you know, this is a hold, this is a long game. It's a growth business. So keep building, keep learning, keep shipping games, keep getting information, keep building your network, keep building bridges with others in this community. It's a it's a it's a great community of people who support each other. Um and it's only going to get better. It's only going to get better. Um, so that's really, I think, the the advice I give is play the long game here. It's a very inspiring advice, and I love it. I love everything you said about this. And speaking specifically about VR in the game studios, so you you work with with many game studios for your your games. It, I don't know how to phrase this question. So how do you identify a successful VR in the game studio? So how to build a successful VR game studio? Well, we have a, you know, we have a, we have a differentiator. We, 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 we want to make games from our IP and that requires studios who understand the value of IP and share our vision for the value of IP. So as someone who runs a business at an IP owner, Sony Pictures, we, we look for studios who, who get that, who understand the value of IP. Not everybody wants to work on somebody else's IP. And I, I understand that, you know? Yeah. Um, I totally get that. Um, but when we say, hey, we've got a Zombieland game, I want the, the, the head of the art group, the head of technology, the you know, head of product to get excited about Zombieland. Uh, I want the, the artists, the animators, their eyes to pop open like, oh, I want to work on that because we want their best product, right? We, we outsource all of our development at Sony Pictures VR. We, we hire dev studios around the world to work on our projects. And so we're entrusting our, our beloved IP to, 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 to teams that have to spend a lot of time and energy and we want to get the best product. So for us specifically, the first and, and most important element is we have the IP, we have what we consider to be really valuable material. Does that attract talent? Are you excited about working on our IP? And in order to do that, sometimes we've got to go, you know, visit the studio and, and look them in the eye and, and talk to people about, you know, Ghostbusters or Jumanji or, or Spider-Man or, 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 or Zombieland. And, and get a sense of if they're really motivated and excited to work on it. 
everything else from that point on can be figured out deal terms and 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 project specifications and you know we've got great producers who who get get stuff done but at the core of what we do is is take ip and turn it into vr games and experiences and in order to do that well we need developers and artists who are excited about working on our ip that's where we start so I, I finished my question, and as always, I am with one final open question. So is there something else you want to add, something I haven't asked you, something that you wish to say, you wish to scream, whatever? It's, it's your time. Mm. <laughs> um, well, oh, let's see. Uh, I think we've, you know, we've covered a lot of things here. I, I'm, what, I, what I think that ultimately is exciting about this space and you do a lot of this in your blog is there are so many different touch points that vr can enter into and we're in a crucial moment in in the world the world has changed i think because of this pandemic um and there's been massive disruption in the way things have been done and some of some of it will swing back i i, I believe people really want to go back to movies, theaters, they want to go back to schools, they want to go back to to restaurants, and we're going to see a big, big wave of people traveling uh, and being IRL, in real life, um, yeah. doing things. But I also think that there's a huge opportunity uh, for digital interactions in immersive um, categories. And so VR has a moment right now where uh, we're seeing real investment, real M&A activity um, into the VR space. I think that's gonna bear some, some really exciting fruit. Um, but I also would say that this space is, um, is unique and for it to be unique, we have to always be focused on what is VR good for versus your phone, versus your computer, versus in real life. And we have to always continue to differentiate what VR can offer from everything else. And to me, that's about being someplace you couldn't be in real life, whether it's a, inside of a world of a movie or on a different planet or underwater or in a fantastical space. Um, VR can offer that in a unique way. And those of us in the community need to lean into that consistently and always answer the question, why is what we're producing only worth producing because it's in VR. And that ultimately, I think, will drive us towards the success that we all want to see in this space. I completely agree. So thanks a lot, Jake, for your time and for participating to this interview. And I want also to thank everyone for watching this, this video. I think that you have found Jake's world amazing. And I wish you a great day. Also inviting you to pay to buy Zombieland on the Oculus store and the future also on PSVR and PCVR stores. So have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.